Hi, I'm Stephen Feinberg, Executive Director of the Rhode Island Film and Television Office. Our guest tonight is Tom Zorabedian. He's a film professor, former Assistant Dean of Colleges of Arts and Sciences at the University of Rhode Island. Tom, welcome to Double Feature. Thank you, Stephen. Happy to be here. Let me ask you something. Movies, cinema. Yes. How did you get involved? What was your, what kicked you off into this world of film? Well, uh, it really started as a child, I, and it started with television. Okay. I was obsessed with television. My father called me Captain Video, <laughs> and so film was a natural uh, progression. And I think I got into it, the reason why other people were attracted to films is because they were a way of taking me away to uh, something different. And then later, when I started looking more closely at film, then I became really interested in deconstructing them. Uh, you grew up in Rhode Island, right? Yeah, I grew up in Providence. Providence, Rhode Island. So, so the shows and the movies took you away to, do you remember like a, a, an early film that, that had an impact on you that propelled you to some other land? Well, of course, in those uh, days, a million years ago, uh, downtown Providence had these great movie theaters, the Majestic, the Strand, the Alby, um, the, Lowe's, the right? Lowe's, and it was one, one movie in, in the whole screen. Uh, so on my toy box, I had a list of my favorite films when I was a kid. And there were Disney films. I think Old Yellow was number one. But then as a kid, I saw uh, my father took me to Lawrence of Arabia, and it just blew me away. I think that was the film that I went from kids' films to really Adult you know, uh, see I didn't understand the geopolitics of it. I'm not sure I still do now. Right. But I knew there was something special going on there. It, was a, it did propel you with, with the visuals and the music. I think Maurice Jarre did this. Dun, dun, yeah. dun, 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 Beautiful. Dun. Yeah. And, and, and David Lean and a great script by Robert Bolt. And it, yeah. it's something where, you know, if you're a kid from Providence, you haven't been into the desert. You haven't been to Aqaba. No. And, and that line became a line between, I went with a friend of mine, Aqaba, every so often. To this day, someone will say, where are you going? We'll say Aqaba. And other people say, what, what are you talking about? So these films line have been, uh, these lines have inculcated my, my daily uh, dialogue. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing I got, which I l really thought about later, with Lawrence of Arabia, because there were plenty of those epics back then, you know, the... Bridge on the River Kwai, yeah, El Guns Cid, of Navarone, El yeah, How the West Was Won, right. big screen with Cinerama. intermissions. Cinerama. Cinerama. Right. I went there very often. But, in fact, that scene where he, where Peter O'Toole mentions Aqaba, originally it was supposed to, this is a little wonky stuff, but I love this stuff, right? He was in the tent, and he decides to do that. And then David Lean said, you know what? this is a little claustrophobic here. Go outside because he wanted the contrast. So he walks out into the desert and he mentions Aqaba and he says that word. And see, that's the first word you said. Yes. And uh, in an interview, I saw David Lean say, drama is contrast. And so that notion of uh, the epic, the desert, but it was really about this one kind of tortured soul. And I look for that in films now. Mm -hmm. it, I, I love in that movie, um, there's a moment where the guy comes across on a motorcycle and he says, who are you? Yeah, he says, I don't know. Who are no, you? Yeah. And that's what the film yeah, is about. Right. Who are you? Right. He's finding his identity. Yeah. Um, so Lawrence, obviously, did, yeah. did, did you want to be a filmmaker or an actor, performer of any kind, or was it just, I'm going to study this? Um, I, I think a, as a kid, those interested me. Uh, you know, at the time when I went to school, we didn't have film studies. Um, th there were a couple film classes, some taught in English, some taught in art. Uh, so I didn't have that option. There, weren't, there were some film schools, the you know, UCLA, USC, NY, uh, NYU, NYU yeah. and um, those were kind of the big three but uh, it was almost kind of a pipe dream to do right. that. And then I evolved more into that later. 
into uh, critical studies. So, so where did you study film, critical studies? Where did that all happen? Well, uh, I, I did some of that just in courses when I went to URI, uh, but I was a... Because the University of Rhode Island, I think when you were going to college, you're a couple of years older than me, yeah. they didn't have a film program. No, that's what I say. They didn't have a film program uh, at all. Um, they didn't even have... Uh, communication studies, it was called speech back then. Right. So I took any kind of film courses. The typical film course that a lot of schools started with was fiction into film. And it was taught by English professors. Right. Uh, so you they, would see like maybe a, you'd read a book. Read a book and see and the movie. A movie yeah. that, or a movie that was similar to that. Right, right, and then talk about how right. it was different. Uh, so I, gra I, I got my degree in English and psychology and actually got a master's in that. And then I decided to study film at BU. And I thought initially, well, I kind of wasted my time with those two. But then I realized I didn't, because what I loved about English was it was storytelling. Yes. And what I loved about psychology, it looked at people's motivations, what, what their highs, their lows, what drove them. Emotion. And that's what I took with me. And I was very lucky when I got to BU to study with a particular professor. Before I went up, a friend of mine had moved and he gave me a bunch of his books, film books. And there were these short books, but all on a particular subject, the 60s, the Western, uh, the 50s, um, uh, film noir. And they were all written by the same person. James Rod Agee? No, uh, I, although I read his stuff, Roger Manvell. Roger Manvell, uh, his name isn't, isn't necessarily that well known, but he was a, a leading figure in the British in, uh, film industry, really when they had a British film industry. And then he became a professor at BU. So I went up there with all my books, and I was looking for somebody to be on my dissertation committee, and it was Roger Manvell. And so I, I was thrilled to have him. Uh, and that's really where I uh, formally delved into and studied film. Wonderful. And then somehow you made your way to the University of Rhode Island. Somehow I came home, yes. How, how did that all happen? Well, uh, I, I first taught at Rhode Island College. I was assistant professor of uh, Back then, it was actually communication and theater. They, they were put together. Uh, and then I went to URI uh, initially as an events person. I ran the um, centennial events. And then I just started teaching courses uh, through the um, film communications department and then film department when we developed an you actual film major. You were creating programs, right? Yeah, we, we uh, under the leadership of Dean Winnie Brownell, yep. we developed the, the film major. And then the, ha the School of Communication, which became the Harrington, Harrington School, School of Communication uh, and Media. So I was involved in fundraising to help raise money from Dick Harrington and others for the school, and then became assistant dean to help um, work with the school and management. So it kind of came full circle. But I was teaching really since uh, at URI since 1994. Wow. Yeah. Are there any particular filmmakers that that you love or that, that, that you have a passion for? Well, there, there are several. Uh, you know, we mentioned Lean. Um, I think of Stanley Kubrick. You know, he didn't make a ton of films because he took so much time between films. But his films are at once surreal. I mean, you look at them, they don't look like real life but the issues he deals with are very real. And I, it's very tough to balance that. I don't think any other filmmaker does it quite like Kubrick. We had the pleasure of having Doug Trumbull here. Oh, nice. Who did the yeah. special effects on 2001. Right. And then Blade Runner and Close yeah. Encounters. And he was talking about Stanley Kubrick, how authenticity, perfection. Obsession with. Obsession with yeah. perfection. Doing something different. Right. And being a rule breaker yeah. was very important to him. Yeah. Right. And there's a lot of uh, messages in his films. Um, we, you know, when you look at uh, Spartacus, and we're talking about the civil rights and, and, and um, the blacklisted yes. writer, Trumbo. Trumbo. Yeah. Uh, got to have his name on that. Yeah. And then, of course, a Dr. Strangelove, which the more I see it now, what, what a tremendous film that is. And what, a, what a performance by Peter Sellers. I was just, um, I was with John Cleese on Sunday, and I was asking him about Peter, Peter Sellers. Peter Sellers, yeah. And he said, you know, because he had spent time with Peter Sellers. Right. And he said, one time Graham Chapman and I came over to see Peter Sellers, and uh, he came down, 
And for three hours, he didn't have the voice of Peter Sellers. He had another voice, and he, he says, mention this to Graham. He, and then, then after three hours, Peter came back. His voice came back. Oh. He said he got immersed. And I said, you know, Hal Ashby put him in being there, being there. Yeah. as Chancellor Gardner. Mm -hmm. And that was a part that Peter Sellers always wanted to play. And after the film was done, for three months, he stayed, he stayed as, Chan in character. as Chancellor Gardner. He yeah. would get very caught up in, but talk about a... Uh, I, I, if you're a performance playing in three parts, three yeah. parts. Yeah, uh, I wonder if he stayed in character of Doctor uh, Zhivago. <laughs> well, that yeah, was the uh, uh, no with uh, Doctor Strangelove. And yeah. right, Doctor Strange, and then I think Mallory, I think was a yeah, character. And, yeah, and he played the British officer. And yeah. you know, he was going to play a fourth. He was going to be the uh, the um, the pilot of the plane and ride down on oh, the bomb uh, the at Slim the end. Pickens. Slim Pickens. He was going to do that part, and he. He said, "No, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it there. I'm gonna do it at three. So uh, Kubrick, right up to Eyes Wide Shut, uh, which again, you look at Eyes Wide I Shut. I need to see it. it I need to see it again. It doesn't look, it doesn't look real. The streets and so on, but obviously it deals with a real issue. And one of the courses I developed, I was lucky enough to be able to develop courses to teach through the Honors Program. And the one I'm, I teach, I'm teaching actually this semester, is Images of Masculinity in Film." And so that that's a film that would be relevant you yeah. know, for the course. Um, we had we we brought in um, Wes Anderson to oh, do yeah. Moonrise Kingdom, right. and I believe some of the we had I think twenty URI students that were yeah. participating in the in the making of the movie. Were you involved at all? And in, like, because they had to go through an interview process. Right. We we just promoted that and publicized that, and there were the uh, Keith Brown and others in the film department really helped you know get the students together but what a tremendous opportunity you know I, I tell students any chance you get to just be on a film just to do anything you're gonna learn a lot just from that experience and they did yeah, yeah. I think the that same was, was with Woody Allen we with had Woody, yeah. we yeah. had Woody Allen uh, filming Irrational, Irrational Man, Man yeah. and I think were you I, teaching a Woody Allen class? Uh, not a Woody Allen class but I teach uh, I include Woody Allen films in fact I worked as an extra in that film, and that was a that was a thrill for me because, in terms of directors, uh, Woody Allen's films have always resonated with me. Right from from Annie Hall to Manhattan, uh, Manhattan Hannah and her sisters, yeah, um, and uh, right uh, Zelig, and uh, including uh, Midnight in Paris, which, right. which is a beautiful film. So th there's a there's a filmmaker that you know really. Were you in the party scene? Me. What scene were you in? I, wa I was. Uh, the one where it was on the balcony there, okay. and I played a parent of uh, <laughs> one of the kids that were there. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it was, just, it was just fun watching him work and just move along and just kind of quietly Very quiet. work with his great uh, DP and um, go from shot to shot. I thought it was interesting with him. He um, was very quiet. But when he was looking and watching the shooting of it, you could see the joy in his face. Like suddenly he was yeah. like really happy to, yeah. um, you could see the joy as the scenes were unfolding. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. What about as far as teaching in cinema with the advent of digital media? Do you, how do you see uh, cinema transforming or evolving uh, with, with the idea that the equipment's readily available. Well, it's made. You know, when I was at BU, and uh, we, we did take a, I did take a filmmaking course. I mean, it was laborious. You know, you had to. We had the 16 millimeter uh, cameras. You'd shoot three minutes or so, and then you'd send it away the and, and you'd wait. It came back, and you say, "Oh, that doesn't look good." <laughs> right. I mean, it just, it just seems so ancient now. Even though the study of 16 millimeter, which URI has a course in, and they do that, and you wonder why, it just uh, shows students the nature of the importance of the shot and editing and really what it takes to put it together. They begin to appreciate the process of cinema, not to mention the historical aspect. And the art of it. Yeah, the, the art of just, it's not just shooting images, it's putting them together and to make a, most of them do narratives. Right. narrative films. So now students have access, we have some great equipment at uh, URI, they have access to cameras that can do things 
that were once called special effects mm -hmm. in films. It's just amazing what they can do, and it's made it more accessible, more affordable, and of course they can shoot scene after scene after scene and not worry about mm -hmm. the, the expense cost of, of film. films. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, the other big change is just the, the streaming. I mean, no, nobody really predicted the extent to which when we used to go to the, uh, the video store, now uh, people can see films whenever they want, almost any film they want at home, which has an up and a downside too. But I also uh, think there's also opportunities of distribution that were never there before. Somebody said, this is really like uh, the, uh, when the Hollywood big golden age uh, where opportunities are available that were never available before because whether it's Disney now having Disney Plus and owning Hulu, et cetera, right, right. they're looking for content. Everyone's looking for content. Right. So there's opportunities for people who make movies or shows, or it could be, uh, I think it's Quibi, I think is the name of right. it, where it's right. like you can have a 10 minute yeah, short, short film. Short, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and YouTube. Yeah, it, you know, the struggle for any filmmaker is, um, getting your work seen. seen. It, it, it used to be making the film and getting it seen. That's always been true. Now you can make it by getting it seen, and there are more outlets. Now, uh, I know you also, um, getting back to uh, some of your past, you uh, worked with Robert Downey Sr. on something. What, what, what was that? Well, I, I was at a uh, the Nantucket Film Festival and met him and got to talking to him and said, would you like to come to URI to speak? He said, yes. So he came up, and I actually got quite friendly with him. And we just, you know, we talk film late into the night. And then uh, for the uh, Rhode Island Film Festival, we did the first master class. It was called, uh, where students would study everything from the, the funding of films. We had a lawyer in about the legal aspects of the shooting, and they actually got their hands on a little production crew okay. and got to be crew. Yeah, and the screenplay we used was one of Robert Downey's um, works in progress that never got made into a film, but it was about his life after his wife died. And, and it was kind of a drama comedy. And he came to Providence and stayed there for a week and worked with the, uh, with the students. So it was a great opportunity, I think, for, for the students that signed up to really have some hands-on experience from one of the um, the the rebels, right? In, in right film. of independent film. Yeah, yeah. Have you had more of those master class uh, opportunities for students since then? Yeah, I, I think the film festival has has had them, uh, and now what we do with students is provide internships. You know, in my right. day, I could count the number of people who had internships on one hand. I think Northeastern was the big school mm -hmm. you went to, and you could actually get credit for work you did somewhere. Now, so many students have internships. In fact, some programs require them. Uh, public relations does, and film is in the process of requiring that. And students can get three credits, 12 credits, oh, even 18 so credits if they go and work we, in uh, L.A. or New York or somewhere. We, we try to provide uh, opportunities yeah, for internships. Yeah, we've done work with your office. Right, yeah. well, like I said whether it's on Woody Allen or the most recently in Nosferatu television series right. for AMC, right. they want to give students, especially if they earn credit, right. uh, that's really important. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, students come back and tell us how much they've learned in that, in that experience. Yeah. Uh, and so it's good for them. Yeah. What about, um, how have you seen uh, education, film education evolve? How is it, and, and how have you evolved as a result of that? Well, as I mentioned, you know, when I was in school, very few schools even had film programs, right. uh, which is one of the reasons I went to BU. Kind of dreamt about going out to the West Coast, but that, that wasn't in the cards. It was expensive, and um, uh, BU was actually a little bit more affordable. Uh, and then we saw uh, film and television evolve as a legitimate academic area and the um, arts yeah and the arts and when we originally put together the the film major the goal and it was written in the proposal to the uh, board of governors to have 20 majors and now they're close to 200 yes. which and what i find interesting this is an age where college is expensive students are justifiably concerned about work afterwards 
So you would think something like film, one of the arts, wouldn't be as attractive during uh, a time where there's so much economic pressure. But yet, they, they are attracted to it, and they realize, I think instinctively, and we also tell them that, yeah, you may want to go on and become a you know, Hollywood director, mm -hmm. and you know, that, God bless you, you can go for that. But there are so many areas where film is used, in marketing, and advertising, and promotional films, in, uh, on the web, uh, that moving images have become part of almost every business. Journalism. Everyday life. Yeah, journalism, um, uh, the internet. So it's not just making movies, right. even though that's what students are interested in, but they can use those skills and they're getting jobs. And some of those storytelling, uh, like you said, on a commercial might be a 30 second story. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, the, the ability to tell a story is really what uh, we've stressed it's the not art just, of visual communication yeah I mean have like you're saying something you're not just shooting uh, right beautiful images and that's important but you have to you have to come to a conclusion so a lot of students come in and of course they're all interested in making films and they initially it may be a less interested in uh, critical studies but then we explain how an understanding of critical studies will inform how they make films. It'd be like being a writer and saying well I don't want to read any books or study <laughs> any literature. Right, right. But I saw an interview with Steven Spielberg how and he talks about to this day he uses what he took from studying um, Citizen Kane. Right. You know, he, he just he, some of the tricks and some of the deep focus and some of the shadows. I mean, or, he or you can see a shot in High Noon and say, why am I feeling what I'm feeling? Because, right. you know, all of a sudden it is, uh, uh, you know, Will Kane, the character, is standing and, and his eyes are shifting and it's close up and then pulling back further and further and further and he's abandoned on a, in the middle of the town alone. The camera's up high right. and he's isolated. Right. And you go, yeah. oh my, that's power. That's why, yeah. That's power. Yeah. That's and a lot, of, a lot of the students I teach through the honors program are not film majors. They take it as an elective. And one of the things I really love about film is that it's a quick learning curve. You know, this is an organic chemistry. It's easy to understand. Even though they're looking at film, they're not realizing what they're looking at. And when you point out the power of a, you know, a, a high, high angle, angle or a low angle, um, a shadow, so now when they see a shadow on someone's face, they know there's something going on here. That, that person's in trouble, or they're lying, or they're in danger. They're, they're, they're learning up consciously what is going on subconsciously. Right. Yeah. And they're seeing the, again, it's the art of communication, and, why, and the importance of composition, and using all the tools in the toolbox. Yeah, yeah, and it is a language. It's like yes. learning of... A, a, a foreign language, except it's the language of visuals. Sp Steven Spielberg, and I love dialogue, you yeah. know, and I'm, I'm working on a book of film dialogue, but he said if you really want to understand the film, watch it with the sound, sound down. off. Yep. Yeah. Now, he doesn't mean the first time. You watch it through. Sure. And I, we, I've done that in class where I've turned the sound down. And of course, your senses then go to pick up the camera movement. And you, you, I tell the students to visualize the camera person and holding the camera and what they're choosing to show or at the director's behest. And it's fascinating to look at a film Have you that seen way. 1917? I did. I did, yeah. So I found that so immersive. And then after seeing the film, I'm going to see it again, because I had heard a podcast afterwards from, right. from uh, what's, uh, the, the, Sam Mendes? Uh, Sam Mendes and uh, the cinematographer. Um, his name will come to me in half a second. But, but, um, how all of a sudden they were there and then he had to get up onto a crane and get down yeah. from the crane, then yeah. back up onto a truck. And yeah. you realize, oh my God. And the guys that might have been pulling cable were also dressed up in uh, soldier outfits. Yeah. So once the yeah. camera went by them, they were as soldiers and they're extras. I mean, there was so much intricacy of uh, Roger Deakins is the name of right. the right, photographer. Right, right. And um, you just talk about the... Technical yeah. and artistry combined, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it, it's stunning. And um, I, I enjoyed that ride. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a sucker for these long takes, particularly long moving right, takes. Right. But this is the other thing about film. You realize how derivative it is from film to film. So one of the... Uh, Orson Welles, the uh, uh, 
uh, something of evil. Um, yeah, touch of evil. Touch of evil. Yeah, the lo and opening the take. Opening that, shot. That, that he was, had to right, redo and right, redo. Right. And Martin Scorsese has done a bunch of those yes. in Goodfellows yep. where they go through the thing. And Hitchcock, obviously. And Hitchcock. And actually, the, uh, Kubrick, likes the, they, they're, yes. they're the mise-en-scene directors, right? right? These long takes. Yep. And in Paths of Glory, yes. that's what I was thinking about that in the foxhole. Right. Just, it was so similar with the camera following. Right. And then there's a, uh, a Claude Lelouch film called And Now My Love, and there's a very similar scene. So those two films came to mind. So when you when you do this long enough, you realize, oh yeah, that's similar to that shot. That's inspires, similar to that inspires film. It inspires it. Yeah, it inspires yeah. it. And that's great. That's what art does, right? You 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 find yourself and you find things that maybe you didn't know about. And yeah. it's just And it makes it more enjoyable. Right. You know, I, I tell uh, it's funny, some of the students will say they're driving their friends crazy because when they watch a film after taking a class, they'll say, oh, look at that. Look at that angle. Oh, look at that. That must be a dolly shot. Then they're saying, will you shut up and watch the film? Yeah. But they're, they're appreciating it more because they're realizing the technique, the, the combination of style and theme and how it combines to make a work of art. I think, too, I find myself when a project sometimes isn't working. Like when I'm watching a film, I'm usually emotionally involved. I forget I'm watching a movie. I'm, right, right. But then if it's not working... I'll ask, why is this not work? Why am I not caring? Why am I? Right. And it might be characters. It might be whatever it is, technical. You don't usually have a feature film now where the sound's not in sync. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. But, yeah. But, um, but continuity yeah, issues. But, you might, but it might be like when something's not there, then you're going to look at it sometimes for its technical flaws or right. whatever or strengths. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much, Tom, for not only having a positive impact on the University of Rhode Island and uh, the state of Rhode Island with film studies. I know you're, you're educating so many young filmmakers um, so that they become better filmmakers, better artists, and better members of the community. And I want to thank you for all you've been doing and will continue to do uh, and for the, the world of cinema. Thank you. Thank you, pal. I enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you.